received his BS, MS, and PhD from MIT. Uh, after that, he joined uh, Harvard uh, with as an IBM uh, postdoctoral fellow before joining the Caltech. Uh, as he briefly mentioned during his presentation yesterday, and also from some of the YouTube videos I was able to find online, uh, he is uh, uh, growing up in the 70s with the gas shortages and the big impact on his uh, career choice. And not being able to go to school in winter because uh, uh, the schools closed due to the gas shortages uh, essentially led him uh, towards uh, 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 science and technology uh, to address the uh, energy challenges. And uh, so that, of course, early focus led, him, uh, led a very successful and impactful uh, career. And uh, his accolade is numerous to count here. Uh, he, uh, he's an editor-in-chief in ACS Photonics and the associate editor for IEEE Journal of Photovoltaics. He's a fellow of MRS and a, national, a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And he received numerous awards uh, over, uh, spanning over decades. Starting from early uh, with the NSF uh, supported uh, PK's award, that's the Presidential Early Career Award, uh, to all the way to 2014 uh, with Julius Springer Prize in Applied Physics. Uh, so, you know, we see his impact of his research uh, through the technologies he's developing, also through his company, uh, but also we see it through uh, the, how much his work is cited. Uh, his, uh, essentially, if you uh, look at his citations, he's been cited 53,696 times. That's as of last night. So it's, <laughs> and there's a reason why I said that. Too. And his age index is over 100, it's 102. There are only 2,610 people that has age index over 100. And this is, throughout the history, every field, including the medical field. Now, side note to number one on that list is Sigmund Freud, so it's a very good company. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so one of his papers published in 2010 on the platforms for uh, improved uh, photovoltaic devices has already 6,287 citations. To put it into perspective, that is 786 a year, which is just over two per day, every day, for eight years. <laughs> and uh, so his research covers nano and microstructures with a focus on plasmonic systems and photovoltaics. And he also works on metamaterials and metasurfaces in two dimensional materials, uh, which is the topic of today. So I'll try to leave you not as psychologically disturbed, disturbed or transformed as Sigmund Freud, but, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, I'll mention I have had a lifelong uh, passion and uh, preoccupation with energy sciences, but energy sciences led me to an infatuation with how light interacts with materials. Uh, and today's uh, lecture is going to talk about this concept. Uh, and what we're going to find through the course of the lecture are going to be a couple of different themes. One is that uh, metals, which uh, are, are used in many diverse applications. Uh, uh, so I was uh, meeting with uh, John Lindowski's team this morning, uh, looking at uh, beautiful applications of metals and alloys. We're going to see that metals allow a uh, possibility of extreme light confinement below dimensions that were previously thought possible, uh, you know, as er recently as 15 years ago or so. Um, moreover, we're going to actually find that. Uh, normally when we think about making uh, photonic materials, lenses and mirrors and uh, uh, components, that those things are fixed at the time of fabrication. We're actually going to learn about how we might actually make uh, uh, using transistor-like uh, photonic devices that are the size and, uh, and, and, and many of the geometrical features of transistors um, to make tune the properties of uh, photonic materials. So this is going to be a I, I know we have a diverse audience here. We have electrical engineers, we have material scientists. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some of the, the, how, the way light interacts with materials. Uh, and as I mentioned yesterday, the, it's a slightly different cast of characters, but uh, uh, completely uh, enabled and uh, propelled by a very talented group of uh, students and postdocs uh, at Caltech and, some, and actually a couple of former alums who are uh, now at Northrop Grumman. The background to my first slide is a, uh, what we see when we look into the light microscope at a uh, thin film of black phosphorus, which is a new two-dimensional uh, material. 
uh, and I'll say a little bit about tuning the properties of that. So first of all, I want to sort of frame the, uh, the, the, the approach I'm going to take today in terms of a grand challenge. Uh, so in nanophotonics over the last 15 years, I'll try to convey a little bit of a sense, if you haven't been in this field, of how it has transformed the way we think about how light interacts with materials. Uh, and I think we're now on the threshold of another, uh, what I would call grand challenge, which is to control all the properties of light, actually. Uh, and this is a little audacious to say that. But to control the wave vector, the wavelength, the amplitude, the phase, and the polarization. And, and if we have uh, comprehensive control of all of those properties, and if we can do uh, actuate something that allows us to control them as a fa function of time, we can make truly, we can, we can tune or temporally modulate all of these properties. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see uh, that the, the approach we're going to take is to think about uh, metal nanostructures as antennas. And metal, uh, the simplest uh, metal nanostructure is a metal nanoparticle, so we'll start there. Uh, and uh, so a metal uh, antenna uh, particle can either scatter light, it could absorb it, uh, if it's a semiconductor, like the materials we talked about yesterday that are highly radiative, uh, they could exhibit luminescence. Uh, and all materials, at least in the infrared, uh, depending on how hot they are, can exhibit uh, thermal radiative emission. Uh, and we can, uh, in principle, using nanophotonic design, control all of these properties uh, of light. So we're going to see what are, what are the, to what extent can we actually make good on that uh, objective. Um, so if we could do that, what are some of the things that might become possible? Uh, and uh, so uh, some of the things that might emerge uh, from this, if we could control the phase of light dynamically, uh, we can think about making the light equivalent of radar. Uh, and this is a uh, concept uh, called LIDAR, light imaging and detection of radiation uh, analogous to, to microwave radiation in radar, uh, which is going to be finding tremendous use. In fact, this is one of those exponentially growing billion dollar markets right now uh, for obvious reasons for being able to uh, do range finding and imaging uh, for autonomous vehicles of various kinds. If we could do this, if we could control polarization, amplitude, and phase, we could uh, so do you remember back uh, when you saw your first Star Wars movie and the uh, uh, little uh, 3D quarter came out and uh, uh, Princess Leia came up and said, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. Uh, uh, so we can imagine thinking about projecting uh, information into three dimensions, into a scattering medium that would allow us from a two-dimensional phase surface, dynamical phase surface, to project and create three-dimensional dynamic holograms. Uh, and I think this is something uh, some of our sponsors are very interested in this, uh, uh, and, and uh, so starting with something that has a, a profile about like your cell phone being able to do something like that. Uh, another opportunity is to uh, give you wireless communications that has a bandwidth that's 100 times greater or perhaps even higher than the current Wi-Fi uh, bandwidths, even with 5G Wi-Fi uh, with the higher frequencies. And that's by using light, and in fact, lighting in the room here, which in, in, in this room it's fluorescent lighting, but increasingly in the future that's going to be uh, driven by uh, solid state lighting, uh, LEDs and so forth. And if we could temporally modulate that at uh, the uh, tens of gigabits or hundreds of gigabits per second, uh, we could actually now uh, bring you very, very high bandwidth line of sight optical communications, uh, wireless communications, uh, <coughs> so uh, at unprecedented uh, data rates. Another approach, uh, if we can uh, make very low cost structures where we can tune the properties, the uh, phon photonic properties, the radiative properties, would be to change the surfaces of, say, building materials from black to white. Uh, we uh, very often, you know, for example, <clears throat> in the daytime, if we were, if our objective was to cool our house in the summer, we'd want our roof to be white uh, in, in the uh, visible part of the spectrum, so we reflect away radiation, and prevent uh, absorption and heating up. But we'd also simultaneously like it to be highly emissive in the black body uh, radiation regime in the infrared, 
where the building itself is acting like a black body uh, emitter, uh, uh, typically in the uh, 8 to 14 micron regime. So we could actually use this irradiative cooling. In fact, in Los Angeles, we've recently uh, passed a, a new ordinance that uh, new paving installations have to be made with cool pavement. Uh, that have reflective, because so much of the LA Basin is covered by pavement, we actually think we can re uh, mitigate the urban heat island effect uh, by changing the radiative properties of the, of the pavement on which everyone walks and drives their cars. Okay, so let's first of all reflect on the first optic revolution. And if you ever have a chance, go uh, in Leiden to a beautiful museum. Leiden in the Netherlands is called the Boerhaave. Uh, and it's a beautiful museum, you can go in for free. And you can see this first microscope that was uh, created by uh, Antony uh, van Leeuwenhoek uh, and, and uh, also followed shortly thereafter by Robert Hooke in England who developed a compound version of this microscope. This was a revolutionary development. It arose from the ability to grind and polish uh, glasses into round lenses that emerged in the, in the 17th century. Uh, in, in, in Europe and in a number of places. It's, a, it's actual, the, the sort of, uh, it, the actual genesis of this is uncertain because it's just sort of one of these things that was in the ether and many people started doing it at once. Uh, but it was revolutionary because the ability to form images that allowed magnification with sufficient resolution transformed our view of the world. Uh, in fact, uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's microscope was used to image live cells, blood cells, white blood cells, red blood cells, uh, sperm cells, and bacteria. Uh, and just to go beyond the optics, just to sort of uh, be a little bit, uh, uh, maybe, maybe uh, a little melodramatic, this actually informed the, uh, the, the thinking of the time, which led, uh, at the, remember at the time that this invention was made, there was an, uh, a, a miasma, an ether theory of disease. In other words, people had a, a, a disease was carried by an ether. Uh, this was the first time that the actual microorganisms that carried disease were imaged. Uh, and that actually, in subsequent centuries uh, in Europe, uh, influenced the direction that public health took in addressing. So th as a result, cities built uh, sanitary systems with sewers and so forth. And uh, uh, Christopher Wren transformed London and Hausmann transformed Paris, partly uh, you know, to change the landscape and make these be dramatic cities, but partly to address these public health challenges associated with sanitation and, and clean water, which were recognized. Uh, and this really advanced the, you know, and of course, instrumentation is, uh, uh, continues to be a huge part of medicine. Okay, so now I want to sit, talk a little bit about, so, so Van Leeuwenhoek uh, ground thin lenses in glass, what we think of as glass or silica. Uh, so let's think about how light propagates in, uh, in first in air. Uh, so light propagates as a, as a, uh, as a plane wave if it's uh, coming from a faraway source uh, in air. Uh, and the dispersion, the relationship between the energy and the wavelength or uh, in, in photonics we talk about the wave vector which is a measure of the also the momentum uh, associated with the light uh, is a linear function so we're used to this idea that uh, linear dielectric media there's a linear relationship between the frequency and the wavelength of the wave vector and that proportionality constant is the speed of light the light propagates at the speed of light through vacuum okay so how about in uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's glass in glass we have an index of 1.46, it's a little higher than air. And if we look at the same relation here between the frequency and the wavelength, we find that now uh, this proportionality constant, the velocity is, is dropped by a factor of one over n. Uh, so the frequency of the light is the same, uh, but now this, and it's still linear, okay? So, uh, but you can see here uh, one of the features is that we have gone, to, we've now shifted the wavelength to a slightly shorter value. Uh, and, and that's one of the strategies with optics of having high index materials. We can support uh, higher wave vectors and shorter wavelengths and we can get better resolution in optics. And now, for example, the best optical microscopes use some medium other than air between the objective lens and the sample using immersion fluid like water or oil or high index immersion lenses. Uh, to beat this wavelength limitation in dielectric materials. Okay, so how far could you go if you used a metal? So what I've done here is to plot a very characteristic fundamental uh, electromagnetic property, which is the dielectric permittivity of silver. 
So silver has a dielectric permittivity. Most dielectrics have, like glass, have positive real and imaginary part of their dielectric permittivity. Metals have the unusual property, or not the unusual, but the, the special property, um, that they have large and negative uh, dielectric permittivities. That means the relationship between the electric displacement and the field uh, is opposite. Uh, and they have a characteristic point where that dielectric permittivity goes through zero. And we call that the plasma frequency or the plasmon frequency uh, for a metal. That's the natural frequency for electron motion in the metal. And it's very similar to the natural frequency of oscillation of electrons in a plasma, a gaseous uh, excited plasma. It's just a much denser form. The imaginary part is always positive. That means the material is lossy. It's not producing gain. We can't make a laser out of silver. But this negative permittivity is very special. OK, so what can you gain by having a negative permittivity? Negative permittivity, if you work through the solutions to Maxwell's equations, allows us to produce a bound surface mode that couples the polarization of the electron. So if we shine light on a metal, the initially uniform electron gas polarizes into positive and negative domains. So you get a polarization of the electron gas, just like we would in a plasma. That polarization of the electron gas produces a locally non-neutral charge distribution that now produces an electromagnetic field. Uh, and if I solve Maxwell's equations, I can show that I have a, a, a mode, uh, a, a, a normal mode or a, a quasi-mode that can propagate. If this me medium were lossless, it would be a true uh, mode of the system, but it's a, a, a quasi-mode. Um, and uh, uh, so this um, will, will, uh, is, is bound uh, to the, the surface. And it has, um, let's see, I wonder if I have another uh, pointer here somewhere. Is there, uh, do, we, do we have another uh, pointer? Oh, thank you very much. OK, great. Mine battery just hit the wall here. OK. Um, so, uh, and the unusual consequence of this is now the dispersion relationship is nonlinear. This is really, really strange and wonderful. For one thing, the dispersion relation flattens out. So this flattening of the dispersion relation, we have to go back to your undergraduate physics and, and recognize that there, we have the phase velocity, the, way, uh, the uh, velocity at which phase fronts of light reach a given uh, point is the uh, frequency uh, over the wave vector. Um, uh, and the group velocity, the, inf the rate at which information is carried is the slope of this line. So you notice that as the curve bends over, the slope is much flatter than the dy dx going from the origin to this point. That means that the rate at which uh, information is carried by the light along the interface slows down considerably. And so we can make slow light in, in materials. Uh, and uh, optics people call this uh, a highly dispersive material. Now you also see that this curve bends back and it, g it goes through a susceptibility resonance. Uh, and there's a very strange mode here. I won't get into this today, but this is the range where we have uh, strange things happen, like negative index and uh, uh, other other materials uh, properties. But that's a, that's a story for another day. The the net result is that at a single interface between a dielectric and a metal, we can make a surface wave that propagates. Uh, it propagates very much like uh, uh, a surface wave propagates on the surface of the water. Uh, if I uh, go to a, a pond, uh, say outside of the city on a warm summer day and the wind is calm and I throw a, a rock into the pond, I can see a propagating surface wave that will propagate uh, in an ever-expanding fashion. Um, so let's analyze this dispersion relation around this susceptibility resonance. Uh, and what we're going to find actually is uh, if we look in this regime up here where the, uh, there's a, this characteristic line is the light line. That's the uh, relation for propagation of light in air. The plasmon dispersion relation is over here. So if I, if I excite at a frequency up here, you can see even if I excite with light very close to the metal dielectric interface, the light goes into the air, basically, and, and, and just radiates into free space. Uh, and uh, it's unbound. We don't see any, uh, any mode on the surface. However, if I now excite it down here where the dispersion relation lies to the right of the light line, uh, then I get a bound mode. 
And as I excite the metal surface, I get a wave that propagates along. You can see it, the amplitude of the wave is going down a little bit, but it's a smoothly propagating wave uh, bound to the surface. Uh, and you can see here, uh, it's extending into the dielectric a little more than into the metal. The metal, of course, has a skin depth. There's a natural distance that the light goes into the metal. It's only a few tens of nanometers. Uh, but you can see the difference here, the dramatic difference if we change the frequency above and below resonance. So we found, uh, and this is, a, uh, this is an artist rendition. I was working with an artist at Scientific American when we wrote this article. Uh, by the way, the little particles here that look like tapiocas or bobas in, a, in your uh, boba drink, those are supposed to be the electrons because he said, oh, I don't want to hear about the, all this electromagnetic wave stuff. I just want to see the electrons. And people that are reading Scientific American want to know that there are electrons there if you, you know, plasmons involve electrons. So those are supposed to be the electrons. And this is supposed to be the, uh, the optical equivalent of dropping the stone in the water and watching the ripples propagate away. Uh, that's the sort of artist fantastic version. We decided, okay, this is a nice idea, but let's go into the lab and see if we can do this. Uh, so what we did was to uh, take a silver surface, uh, and then we coated that silver. We, we, we uh, used the focused ion beam tool to make a groove in the silver surface here. Um, we made a circular groove and, a, and an elliptical groove in an otherwise planar film of sur uh, silver. Uh, and then in the simulation, we excited it, and we saw these sort of... Uh, Bessel function-like uh, bound modes to this structure that basically this is a, uh, uh, acting like a little resonator for surface plasmons. And you can see here, what we did ne next was to coat the surface with photoresist, a uh, photoresist material, and use the plasmons to expose the photoresist. And then uh, we later took it out uh, and then we made an AFM topograph of the exposed photoresist. And you can see here this beautiful sub-wavelength ripples, the, 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 w the water waves, uh, you know, after you drop the uh, the rock into the pond, they're propagating out and backwards. But these are nanoscale waves uh, of bound surface plasmon modes uh, that were created. And you can see, even though you can't, the, the, the surface waves are bound to the surface, you can't see them directly in the far field. By using the resist, we were able to image the fields in the near field. So you can now do this also with a near field microscope too. Uh, but this is a, a way of encoding the, this kind of structure. You can see here in this elliptical cavity, you can actually see the two foci of the ellipse, the two fo focal points of the plasmon node. Okay, so that's, that's nice, but it, then we can even do more dramatic things, which is to squeeze light into tiny little volumes. And this is an experiment done by a remarkable young scientist, uh, Hidaki uh, Miyazaki in the National Institute for Material Science in Japan, who made little metal structures with uh, 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 glass or silica films sandwiched between layers of gold. And what he showed was that by making this gap get progressively smaller, he could squeeze light into these little gap. We call these gap plasmons. And uh, I won't go into the details, but they, these modes that I have depicted here uh, satisfy Maxwell's equations. And for light with a wavelength what, that we call uh, 500 w frequency, we say 500 terahertz light. That's yellow light to those of you who see in free space. If instead you saw in glass or in metal, you, you would say it was a different color because uh, you, you see now the lexicon of optics has to be carefully uh, uh, defined uh, because there's a, it, w in dispersive materials, we don't have a linear relationship between frequency and wavelength. So it's, you can see here the frequency of light here in free space is the same as it is as it goes into this gap, but the wavelength has shrunk dramatically from 620 nanometers in free space down to 200 nanometers inside a 30 nanometer gap, uh, 10 nanometer, uh, 120 nanometers inside a 10 nanometer gap, and down to 40 nanometers. Uh, uh, now more than a factor of 10, about a factor of 13 smaller uh, wavelength. So we've shrunk the wavelength, you know, honey, I shrunk the wavelength uh, inside this gap uh, of the materials. And this is the sort of really revolutionary idea behind uh, nanophotonics is that we can actually use, uh, we, can, we can change the dispersion properties of light. Uh, this creates a cavity here where the wavelength is now 8% of the wavelength in free space. If I made a cavity here uh, with this little gap plasmon, it has a volume which is a 1 1,000th of a cubic wavelength in free space. So if I made a free space cavity with metal mirror walls, it would be a, a 1 cubic wavelength. This is 1 1,000th of a wavelength in size. And we'll see with graphene, we can go down to 1 1 millionth or smaller cavity size, the smallest cavities that have ever been made. 
Okay, so then uh, we sort of uh, uh, wildly speculated that you would be able to make sort of transistor-like devices where you could take this gap-like plasmon mode that Hideki saw uh, and be able to create a structure where light could come in, light could come out, and we could do something to this structure that looked like a, a field effect gate uh, and control the optical mode inside this structure. That was wild speculation at the time this article was written more than 10 years ago. Um, but it is a, 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 a nice kind of motif for explaining how light gets in, gets squeezed, and then can come back out again. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And we made a number of wild speculations. Uh, and the great, it's sort of like Star Trek, everything in Star Trek, the, the truism, everything in Star Trek is true. You're come, just, you have to wait a little while. It turned out that the, the great thing was thousands of people jumped into this field. Uh, and we didn't have to do everything ourselves because we couldn't obviously do it. Uh, but many of these predictions that we made came true. That their extreme confinement of light was uh, discovered by many uh, groups uh, with very strong near-field interactions. It has uh, tremendous implications for sensing, making very sensitive uh, uh, sensors of single molecules, for example, using Raman scattering and infrared in chemistry. Uh, negative permittivities support these uh, special squeezed modes that I talked about. I'm also going to talk about something, uh, the special pro th properties of materials near the uh, epsilon near zero, where the plasma frequency lies. Um, and so one of the features about metals is that they have very high carrier densities, sort of roughly one free electron per atom uh, in, in the unit cell. Uh, that's very different, of course, from uh, semiconductor materials, and, and that's going to come into play as well. So even though we thought we were pretty clever at having uh, sort of, uh, you know, start launched a revolution in uh, nanophotonics uh, by thinking about metals, the truth is that the, the practice of nanophotonics has been in uh, full swing for millennia. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, ancient ceramists, this is a beautiful artifact you can find in the British Museum in London called the Lycurgus Cup. This is a uh, a, a dramatic depiction of this Greek god uh, uh, Lycurgus, who is um, um, uh, is uh, uh, attacking Dionysus, uh, uh, and apparently it's a, it's an argument like these Greek myths are over a woman. It's uh, ambrosia, uh, uh, but the remarkable thing about this cup is that it derives its color from the light scattering properties of small embedded gold and silver particles. And in fact, this is, of course, this beautiful window uh, in the Notre Dame de Paris uh, Cathedral, um, similarly color fast for more than 800 years because of the light coming from the plasmonic properties of the embedded uh, metal nanoparticles in a, a, a dielectric ceramic matrix. Uh, so we're going to actually, if you get nothing else out of this lecture, you're going to learn why this Lycurgus cup learn, it looks red when you shine light from the inside and looks green from the outside. You should go to the British Museum and see it yourself. So if I take a, a, a vial full of silver nanoparticles and I put them into a spectrophotometer, here's what I would see. I would see a sharp resonant uh, uh, absorption. Uh, right at the plasmon resonance of the metal nanoparticles. If I did this with gold, I'd see also a sharp resonant absorption. It's a little asymmetric. This has to do with the fact that in gold there are interband transitions that from the D bands that lie below the Fermi level in gold uh, that are further away in silver. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why when you look at gold, it has sort of a yellowish color. It's absorbing in the blue and uh, uh, absorbing through the electronic interband transitions in the blue. Uh, plasmon resonant scattering in the red and then uh, uh, scattering re reflecting in the orange and yellow. Similarly for copper, uh, uh, silver is a sort of colorless uh, metal and the reason is because its plasmon resonance lies very close to, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit bluish. You, have, you know, people talk about a blue, blue complexion. If you swallow a lot of silver nanoparticles, your face will turn blue. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, due to this uh, blue light scattering. The characteristic line width here is due to the dephasing or relaxation time of the plasmon, the plasmon decay time. It's relatively broad as these things go, uh, and the, the decay times for plasmons are relatively short. Um, so what we can see, that, that, that resonant absorption is coming from the, um, the polarizability, the polarization response of the metal particle, just like uh, an atom is polarized. The bound electrons in an atom are polarized in an electric field and generate a resonant susceptibility response. 
so the electrons in a small metal particle exhibit a resonant susceptibility. So you have a resonant rise in the real part of the absorption or scattering. Uh, and you also have an imaginary part, which gives rise to a phase shift. And that phase shift will turn out to be very important. Uh, and so at resonance, one of the things that happens, this, this resonant enhancement of absorption, if you look at, uh, if you trace the field lines, you see that this acts like a scavenger or a concentrator for light. Light comes in in a plane wave, and I looked at, if I look at all the uh, pointing vectors uh, uh, map of the light, you can see uh, at resonance, the light, uh, the cross section of the particle, as expressed by this uh, absorption resonance, is much larger than the physical cross section. The particles gathering in light from its surroundings, it's quite remarkable. So back to the Lycurgus cup, why is it uh, uh, green uh, viewed in reflected light? And if I put a white light LED flashlight inside, it looks kind of red. Uh, if I take the white light and I uh, uh, I shine light on it uh, fr from the inside. I see resonant absorption in the gold particles in the blue. Um, I see a resonant extinction in the green from the surface plasmons. And I see the red glow coming from the transmission through the cup, through the ceramic layer of the cup. Uh, in, the, in the case of viewing it from white light from the outside, it looks primarily green uh, because uh, red light is transmitted. Uh, and the, the scattering cross-section uh, is uh, actually stronger for these particles than the absorption cross-section. So from the outside, then the scattered light uh, is predominantly green, so which is why you see this uh, characteristic color. So fun. OK, so now von Leeuwenhoek's uh, lenses had the characteristic that um, they were ground glass structures. And the way that we manipulated phase and we produced, for example, changes in a plane wave phase front is by uh, refracting light, or you could think about changing the velocity of the light as you go from free space into this uh, structure. And by in a thin lens, what you're doing is basically changing the thickness across the uh, beam size uh, and, and, and advancing the phase uh, by different amounts. Uh, the, the ray tracing sort of uh, uh, result of that is that light uh, is propagated and focused to a focal point. Uh, and so that's based, you know, that's essentially what all of our modern optics are based on. A contemporary of Van Leeuwenhoek's, Huygens, Christian Huygens, had a very different idea that was a very clever principle uh, that's been used all over science. Uh, and that is this uh, principle of a, uh, 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 of a Huygens uh, phase front, uh, that if we have an array of scatterers, point scatterers, they scatter out light in spherical waves that look like circular waves in two dimensions here. Uh, so an incoming plane wave scatters out little uh, spherical waves. And the uh, envelope of the phase fronts that emerge from this form a new plane wave phase front. And if I am able to adjust the relative phase of these scatterers, I can now, regardless of the refractive index of this medium or this medium, I can now bend the light just due to the phase shifts uh, and the gradient in the phase along this surface. So that's going to be the fantastic principle that allows us to take nanophotonic sort of two-dimensional structures and to manipulate light uh, and make lenses that are as flat, uh, sub-wavelength and thickness. Uh, so this is a uh, very uh, vivid illustration of this. This is from the paper by Nanfang Yu and Federico Capasso, who first showed that plasmonic antennas of this kind scattering light from a surface with these different kinds of antennas. These antennas have about the same scattering amplitude, but they have different phases. You can see a couple of wavelengths away from the surface, this Huygens principle is beautifully at work, that the, the scattered spherical waves coming out of these uh, antennas are merging together into a plane wave phase front that's refracted. And it's refracted due to the phase difference between these antennas. OK, and this has led to a huge explosion. Uh, many of the photonics people in the room are familiar with this, about this so-called world of metasurfaces, uh, where we've now been able to print, using 2D lithography methods that are borrowed from microelectronics, metal nanostructures that are very complex that can produce uh, all kinds of strange states of light. We can make vortex beams, so we can make beams of any polarization. We can make flat lenses. Uh, you can make them in metals and dielectrics. You can encode holograms. Uh, you can uh, do polarization conversion. There, you, you can uh, uh, do many of these things that I uh, expressed an aspiration for at the beginning of the talk. Um, the challenge is that all of these functions are encoded at the time that they were lithographically patterned. Uh, 
And, and then you're fixed for all time. So you, you, you get a hologram, but it's one hologram. It's like a, a, a daguerreotype. So we want to move from the daguerreotype and still life picture to the film and television era for nanophotonics. So to do that, uh, we need to have uh, tunable elements. So let's ask the question, how well could we tune a metal nanoparticle itself? Uh, and a metal nanoparticle, as I mentioned, has a pretty high electron density, about one electron per, per, per unit cell per atom. Uh, and you can see here, this is how I could tune the extinction spectrum if I could change the metal nanoparticle carrier density uh, by 3%. And I'll show you in a minute, that's about the limit of what we can do. Uh, and you can see here, we can tune it a little bit. Uh, in fact, you can see that the peak is moving a little bit and actually it's getting broader, more scattering uh, of electrons on the surface. Um, but it's fairly limited. Uh, this is an experiment that we did. This is by Anna Brown, a talented student who did this experiment, putting metal nanoparticles essentially inside an electrochemical cell with an ionic liquid. Uh, and we had to apply such a large potential, we actually went through the gold redox uh, uh, potentials. We actually oxidized gold and reduced it. The data I'm showing you here are outside the range where we did redox. It's all gold. It's not a transformation due to gold oxide. But you can see there's a little bit of tunability. Uh, and that corresponds to changing the charge density by a few percent. And so that tells you how much you can tune a metal. But I bet you didn't know before you came in this room that you can actually tune the optical properties of a metal by applying a voltage. And you can. Except maybe Art Hoyer, I can uh, imagine, I uh, would uh, uh, convince, be convinced of that. OK. So we need to go to some slightly different materials. And we're going to go to materials that have slightly lower electron densities. Uh, and the, the, the thing is, with the external electric field is so efficiently screened in a good metal by the high density of the electron gas, we need to lower the electron density. If we go all the way to a semiconductor, now we lose the negative permittivity that makes plasmonic structures special. So we're going to go to materials that have intermediate electron densities. So uh, some of these are intermetallics, like uh, silicides, uh, conducting oxides, graphene, uh, many of the two-dimensional materials that have carrier densities e uh, intermediate between those of metals and semiconductors. Okay, so here's an example of a material that you all uh, have. Uh, I, I, I feel virtually sure that everybody in this room owns a piece of indium tin oxide. How many people have one of these? The surface of the screen is coated with a semi-transparent conductive layer of indium tin oxide. Uh, and you can see here, this, the, the carrier density is relatively low because it just has to act like a DC conductor. If I crank it up a little bit to 10 to the 19, to 10 to the 20, to 10 to the 21, you can see by eyeball spectroscopy, basically it's changing color a little bit. And this is the imaginary part of the complex uh, refractive index or complex permittivity of uh, ITO, indium tin oxide. It's a wide band gap oxide that's degenerately doped and that's how it gets its conductivity. Uh, and you can see its absorption is rising as the carrier density rises. And in fact, it starts to absorb in the visible. Uh, but if we look at the real part of the permittivity, we see here that it, from the infrared, the telecommunications band, into the near visible range, in this carrier density range, where the carrier density goes from 10 to the 19 to about 10 to the 21, we can shift the permittivity from positive to negative. That literally means, in electromagnetic terms, we're changing the material from being dielectric to metallic. So, uh, and and uh, this was done by chemical doping in ITO. We're going to see in a minute we can do this electrically as well. And the way we do this electrically is we now take this ITO film and we turn it into a little transistor. Uh, we turn it into a transistor that has a gate, a gate insulator, and now the semiconductor is not silicon or some other th material, semiconductor material, it's ITO. So what we're doing is the same thing you do in a field effect transistor. You're bending the bands uh, and you're accumulating and depleting carriers at the surface of the ITO using this gate, which applies a field across this gate dielectric. And we've carefully chosen the gate uh, carrier density in the ITO, the background carrier density, such that when we apply a voltage that's within the range before we break down the insulating gate, we can tune the permittivity within one nanometer of the surface from positive to negative. OK, so you might say, well, OK, that's, that's impressive, but it's only one nanometer. I mean, that's, uh, and that's because the, at this high carrier density, the screening length uh, in a material is very high. The charge is being screened by the very high carrier density. So what can we do that's useful with this one nanometer? What we can do is squeeze this little 
uh, transistor-like structure inside an optical antenna. This optical antenna is, consists of a planar reflector and a little uh, gold nanoparticle, very similar to the one. It, it happens to be square rather than round, but otherwise its electromagnetic properties are similar. Uh, and inside, we've squeezed this little transistor-like structure. So the, the antenna uh, face here acts as a resonant antenna. It also acts as the gate for this little transistor-like structure. Um, and we can change the carry density in the indium ton oxide. And so this is a, a, a wired up array of, of, of gates in one dimension. These are the little antennas. Uh, these are the gates that it, with different independent electrodes applied. Um, so now let's think about what we're going to try to do. I mentioned that as we tune through resonance, we can change the scattering amplitude and also the phase. And so in the last 10 years or 15 years, people have spent a lot of time uh, worrying about the amplitude of the and extinction and dispersion. They haven't paid that much attention to the phase. But phase is very important. In fact, I was just talking with uh, John Lewandowski's group this morning. And they were showing me uh, cross sections of a Navy ship uh, and on the, uh, uh, on the front of the Navy ship was a so-called phased array radar. And a phased array, remember the good old time ra radars used to rotate. There was a rotating beacon and an antenna that would rotate around and that's how you would scan the horizon. Nowadays that's all done electronically. The radar is completely fixed in, in, in stationary. And we adjust the relative phase between microwave amplifiers and according to Huygens principle, these emanate little circular waves that form a plane wave that is, goes out in some direction. And by changing the relative phase of these structures, I can change the width of the beam and its direction. And I can steer it around. Okay? And that's how radars work nowadays. That's how the radar in the airplane that you fly on uh, works as well. It's very compact and does not involve any moving parts. Um, so could we do this at optical frequencies? The, the, in this case, we're actually directly modulating the signal at microwave frequencies. We have electronics that's fast enough to do that, to modulate frequencies in the time domain. We don't have transistors that can modulate at 500 terahertz, at least not yet. Uh, so how are we going to do this? The way we're going to do this is to use this permittivity shift um, to steer beams by changing the phase of the reflected light as we tune through the resonance of an antenna and steer a beam. Uh, and you can imagine, and our, our sponsors from Samsung are very eager for us to get to this stage where we have a laser that's embedded in the front of your car that scans the horizon at uh, 1.5 microns. And that's sort of the application domain that we're thinking about. <coughs> uh, but this is the idea, to make a little tiny LIDAR, a little light radar uh, uh, using these nanoplasmonic antennas. So here's how it works. Uh, the antenna uh, is this little block of metal Here's the transistor-like structure where we accumulate and deplete the electrons. If we look at the electromagnetic mode at resonance, there's a so-called magnetic dipole mode that's squeezed in. I showed you the, how we can squeeze modes into a gap. We're doing the same thing here. Uh, we have a resonant, uh, and we adjust the resonance by changing the geometrical properties of this to exactly overlie the uh, wavelength range where the permittivity crosses zero, the epsilon near zero regime. And in that regime, where we tune the carrier density a little bit, we can produce relatively large phase shifts and changes in the amplitude at optical frequencies. So this is what they look like. This is what the little transistor-like devices look like. Uh, and this is the, at 1.5 microns uh, in the telecom band, <clears throat> the modulation here of the reflectance. In a relative sense, the reflectance is changing by about 50%. Uh, the overall reflectivity is low. It's a little bit inefficient, but it turns out that that's not a major shortcoming. We can still uh, use this kind of device. Um, but the important thing is that we can also modulate the phase. Uh, and this is a measurement. We actually use a fringe shift measurement in a Michelson interferometer or interferometry setup uh, to measure the phase. And we can see as we apply a voltage to our little transistor-like structure, we're actually adjusting the phase by about pi. If we could modulate all the way to 2 pi, we could access any uh, uh, phase state uh, that I would be needed to reconstruct a hologram. And so that's our, our goal. In other devices I won't tell you about, we've been able to get up to about um, 3 halves pi or a little bit further, not quite to 2 pi. Uh, but this is a transistor-like structure. It can run, we've actually run these up now to, uh, to 100 megahertz. Uh, so, so you can actually scan these at very, very high frequencies. And you can make these uh, act as uh, as, as beam scanning uh, devices that can image and using uh, pulsed echolocation map out three-dimensional images of, of structures. And we actually showed that this works by making a tunable diffraction grating 
Uh, this is the experiment and the theory. As we change the voltage on this little transistor-like structure, the surface goes from at one, one where all the antennas have the same phase, so we get specular reflection at zero degrees. Uh, there's just uh, specular reflection at normal incidence. Uh, the specular refracted beam goes away and breaks into a plus one and a minus one order diffracted beam. Essentially, we've made a switchable diffraction grating. So now I can, uh, by applying different voltages to the gates, I can uh, make whatever phase uh, relationship I want. So uh, another thing that we can do, I, I talked about changing the emission rate. And uh, uh, Giuseppe asked me yesterday about, uh, can we change the uh, emission rate of quantum emitters? Uh, and this is a case where we're using now a titanium nitride material, similarly changing it from plasmonic to dielectric. Uh, and we have this embedded in a little transistor-like structure where we can shine light through and pump and excite luminescence in indium phosphide quantum dots. These are the same indium phosphide quantum dots that are inside the quantum dot TVs you can now buy from Samsung in your local Circuit City or uh, uh, Fry's Electronics store. Uh, and uh, so you can see here that if we change the optical environment, the so-called local density of optical states around this, we change the permittivity of the uh, titanium nitride. Uh, there's a lot of detail here, but basically applying the voltage, we can change the permittivity from near zero to uh, highly negative, uh, from uh, uh, near resonance to quite metallic uh, in, in this frequency range. And uh, what we know is that the emission rate, the number of photons emitted into the far field, is proportional to the optical environment, the so-called optical density of states or mode density. And we can change this by changing the permittivity. And so we've been able to show that we can change the amount of light coming out. And the, not only the amount of light coming out, because you might say, well, OK, all you're doing is you're changing the absorption or reflection. But we actually measured the lifetime or the emission rate of photons. And we can see that we're actually changing the quantum efficiency. So you ask, uh, you know, for example, if, if, can we take a bad emitter? Can we put it in an environment with a uh, higher optical density states, so make it emit radiative photons faster than the non-radiative rate? We can do this, and we can actually do it uh, with, in a tunable fashion. So we actually have proposed this, and Samsung is interested in this as a potential uh, future display technology where you optically pump the quantum dots and then simply change the amount of light coming out of each pixel by tuning its local density of optical states. The advantage of that is you don't have to inject carriers into the quantum dot. That has a significant reliability uh, impact on the quantum dot uh, displays that involve direct carrier injection. So it could be a very reliable display. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about 2D materials. Um, I, I think I probably have too many slides here. But I, I, I just want to uh, 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 make uh, people aware that uh, there's an, uh, an explosion, for those that are not involved in it, of, of research on these fascinating materials, layered uh, Van der Waals bonded materials, uh, like the ones I talked about yesterday, the metal uh, chalcogenides. Uh, but they span a, a range of electronic properties from semi-metallic to true metals uh, now. Uh, uh, and to narrow band gap semiconductors across the electromagnetic spectrum. So these are really special uh, in, in many fields of science, but they're also special in photonics. Uh, and, and so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about graphene uh, and mention that graphene has this uh, characteristic uh, feature of this hexagonal honeycomb lattice that gives rise to an unusual electronic dispersion. It's a linear dispersion, not parabolic like most semiconductors uh, are. Uh, but because it's one layer thick, if I make a gated structure like I did for the uh, indium tin oxide structures, I can change uh, electrically the chemical potential for the electrons. I can dope uh, graphene either uh, p-type or n-type simply by changing uh, the potential on the gate. Uh, and as a result, uh, and graphene, as a conductor, also supports surface plasmons, both uh, plasmons that propagate along a free surface. Or if I pattern this into little uh, uh, ribbons or particles, I can make little dipole-like resonators. Uh, so what about graphene? What about its optical properties? People have talked about graphene, actually, as a transparent electrode material, even. And the reason is because a single layer of graphene, while it has uh, an extremely high absorption per monolayer, this, by the way, it's, it's a monolayer absorption can be expressed in terms of fundamental constants. This is pi times the fine structure constant. That emerges from the extreme 
two-dimensional confinement of electrons in a, in a two-dimensional sheet of graphene. It's unusual that you see a physical quantity expressed in terms of two fundamental constants of nature. That tells you there's something very fundamental about this absorption. Uh, and it is. And this number is about 1 over 137. This is 3. So this is about uh, 60. And so that's a little more than two and a half, about 2.5% absorption per single pass absorption. So we were motivated by the idea, could we actually, instead of making graphene be interact relatively weakly with light, create 2% absorption, could we absorb 100% of the light in a sheet of graphene? That seems like a fairly big challenge here. This is 2%. Um, so one way we can do this is to make graphene resonators. Uh, since graphene is two-dimensional, uh, we make ribbons. Uh, and if we excite them with a polarization transverse to the ribbon, that acts electromagnetically similar to the metal nanoparticles that I showed you in three dimensions. They support dipole-like electromagnetic resonances. We can tune the electrical conductivity from being highly resistive near the Dirac point to being highly conducting. Uh, and change these uh, permittivity from positive to negative. The electromagnetic modes are ex have exhibit extreme confinement. The modes are confined within a couple of nanometers of the graphene sheet itself. The, the fine print here shows that the mode is 30 nanometers wide. That's a, uh, in one of these, uh, here's a 15 nanometer ribbon. Here's a, about a 40 nanometer uh, ribbon here. Uh, so if I were look, looking at the mode, I would see this kind of confinement. So basically what it says is that the mode is sampling and interacting with this extremely small environment. So if I, this is a, a powerful thing. And in fact, uh, other people in this field are, are using these as single molecule sensors because you can drop a single molecule into this regime and all of the light that's interacting with the graphene interacts with uh, 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 you know, single molecules. Uh, so to enhance the absorption, we use an effect that was first uh, uh, recognized in the microwave uh, field, uh, which was how to make surfaces of metals be perfectly absorbing. And the answer, of course, is very simple. It's to match the uh, impedance of the metal to the impedance of free space. And that's the, how an electrical engineer would think about it. So we basically match, uh, the, but the, the wave optical way to think about it is light comes in, scatters from these graphene resonators. If I put a mirror behind it, the, and light, part of the light transmits through, and reflects from the mirror, if I get cancellation of the light reflected from the mirror from the light reflected from the graphene, I'd get 100% absorption. So that was an interesting idea. And we tried that, and we were able to get the absorption up from 2% to about 25%. That's fairly impressive for a submonolayer thickness uh, uh, sheet of graphene uh, by changing the carrier density, but it still wasn't 100%. Um, we're able to show also that if we heat this up, we could show not only tunable absorption, but the obvious uh, uh, inverse, which is that this ex exhibits a tunable thermal emissivity. Normally, we think about the thermal emissivity as being a sort of constitutive property of matter. But this is now showing that we can apply a thin layer on the surface of a material and electronically change its emissivity. In other words, at constant temperature, we can change the amount of thermally radiated power. Uh, Normally, we change the amount of thermally radiated power by heating something up. Uh, and this is at constant temperature. So we showed that that's the case, that we can see as we more heavily dope these graphene ribbons, they become better uh, uh, emitters, uh, that the amount of radiation goes up. But we really wanted to get to 100%. So how do we get to 100%? The way we had to do it was to recognize that the graphene sheets themselves were not conductive enough. We couldn't get the impedance to match the impedance of free space. So we made a more complex structure that had slits in a metal film. And inside each little slit in the metal film, we made uh, ribbons of graphene that were 100 nanometers wide. And the slits in the metal film funnel the light by surface plasmons in the metal into these little gaps. And all of the light incident on the surface gets funneled into interacting with these ribbons. So these ribbons comprise less than 10% of this monolayer uh, on the surface. And we were able to show that we could get the absorption to go from uh, around 10% to 97% at a wavelength of uh, 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 8 microns or so. So when Steve Chu, uh, Secretary of Energy in the Obama administration, was uh, visited the Queen of England, he went to Buckingham Palace. And uh, he said, to, the Queen asked, what can I do to uh, improve the energy efficiency and set an example to the British people? And he said, paint the roof of Buckingham Palace white. 
and the queen politely demurred because she didn't want to uh, deface a, a national historic uh, register uh, 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 place. Um, but what this illustrates is that we could now take a material, which is now uh, whatever color you like in the visible, and we can change its uh, emittance in the thermal radiation band from being basically black to white. So you could choose, for example, if you wanted to uh, warm your house by uh, thermal absor you know, absorbing radiation, uh, uh, make the emissivity low. If you wanted to radiate efficiently to the cold background of space, and cool your house down. In fact, uh, my colleague Sean Hui Fan at Stanford has shown you could actually cool below ambient temperatures this way. Uh, you could actually change the emittance. Uh, so uh, if we can find a way, th this tell shows you that we can now tune materials and tune the emittance properties. Let's see, how am I doing on time here? I, I'm close to my time limit, yes. right? Okay. Uh, so I have much more to tell you. It turns out we can make tunable antennas, very much like I showed you. Uh, at uh, near-infrared frequencies, we can do these in the mid-infrared. We can make tunable graphene antennas. The goal here is to be able to steer thermal radiation. Thermal radiation has enough coherence. We don't normally think of thermal radiation as being coherent. But it has enough coherence, spatial coherence, that if we vary the phase of antennas, we could, st instead of radiation coming out more or less isotropically of a body, we could steer it in different directions if we wanted to. Uh, and so that's uh, one of the goals. We're working with a team at Northrop Grumman to do this using a device that looks like that and steer it in a given direction. Uh, now, I, I won't tell you much about black phosphorus except just to say that this is a, uh, uh, a fantastic uh, material and has uh, surprises of its own. Uh, uh, for example, it is optically anisotropic in plane. It supports plasmons and using some of the same light confinement techniques that we can use in graphene, uh, we can make uh, structures here in, in black phosphorus um, that uh, act like tunable quantum wells. Um, we can uh, m make structures where uh, we tune the Fermi level up and down, uh, filling up and emptying out bands. Uh, and in black phosphorus, just, it makes little quantum wells, just like quantum wells of gallium arsenide, in thin flakes of the material. Uh, and we can see the quantum well structure. And so we think there could be very interesting quantum well physics that we can access in in, in black phosphorus. So uh, before I finish, I want to just uh, remind you that tomorrow we're going to embark on the third grand challenge. Uh, and that is to use some of the principles, principles that I told you about today uh, uh, of nanophotonic design to create spacecraft that can travel beyond our solar system to nearby stars within the lifetime of some of you, maybe not me and Art and uh, maybe, maybe Giuseppe is on the borderline, uh, but so within the range of the graduate students in the room, within your lifetime. Uh, and so we're gonna also, uh, it's an exciting project um, called the Breakthrough Starshot Pro Project to develop spacecraft propelled by light, uh, which can move at relativistic speeds. Uh, this is, uh, uh, and, interesting, and we'll talk about how that could be possible and what's required to make it happen. So I'll, I'll quit here and I, I'll just mention I, I told you about how we can make uh, little tunable antennas uh, that allow us to go from the still life to the sort of movie stage of nanophotonics where we can dynamically modulate the phase, the amplitude, I didn't say it today, the polarization, uh, the emission rate. Uh, and to make uh, complex devices that we've only had at lower frequencies that are now going to be possible at optical frequencies. Thanks very much. Any questions? Yes, Connor. How sensitive are the uh, tunable parameters to temperature in your system? In other words, you're talking about high absorbance uh, mono layers. And in that case, I imagine uh, they'll be absorbing a lot of thermal energy. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah, it's a really good question. If you're talking about 100% absorption in a monolayer, <laughs> what are the thermal <laughs> performance issues? Um, fortunately, the, you know, those materials are not freestanding. Uh, they're in thermal contact and, and in thermal steady state. We've actually done ComSol simulations to figure out what the temperature gradients look like through the materials. In the, uh, and part of it is a function of the intensity. We're doing experiments actually using very ultra high powers using pulse lasers and there the graphene can get out of equilibrium even and, uh, meaning non-fermi like distribution of electrons very hot uh, plasmons but for structures where you're using sunlight or uh, you know that kind of level of intensity 
less than a watt per square centimeter. Um, it, it's pretty iso, isothermal. Uh, there are small temperature variations, but it, it, it's, it's because the uh, optical properties, uh, although they're changing dramatically, um, the, the, yeah, they're, they're still in contact conductively with this uh, background. In fact, that's how, for example, the thermal emission works. I, if, I, if I had a, a sheet of graphene that were itself, it has such low heat capacity that if it had a chain, big change in emissivity, it would lower its temperature, right? Uh, that would be a, a way of doing refrigeration, sort of optical refrigeration, actually, uh, if you could make a, but since it's in contact conductively with a high heat capacity body, it maintains near isothermal conditions, yeah. Yes. Yeah. This fascinating field of interactional electromagnetic radiation with matter. Uh, you're discussing plasmonics, which is the coupling of electromagnetic which the free electrons in the metal, subsurface electrons in the metal. It also reminds one of changing the refractive index in uh, metal materials. Yeah. Like the work of Sir John Pendry at Imperial College. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if you have any collaboration, your group, it's a John Penn. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, John is a good friend and collaborator for a long time. And I think these fields have, I, I guess, plasmonics, I didn't get into the details because there's just so, so much you can fit into one talk. Um, these uh, terms are used somewhat loosely by the, many people, including practitioners, but Roughly speaking, plasmonics refers to the domain of electromagnetic uh, uh, activity where the permittivity of the metal is positive, but the permeability, the magnetic uh, constitutive parameter, remains positive. In metamaterials, in fact, we have made, we, show, we actually made some of the first optical frequency negative refractive index materials. It's my interactions with John. Uh, and, uh, in that case, you're making the permeability and the permittivity simultaneously negative. Uh, that requires a little more art, and that's what we call the field of metamaterials. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's a, it, it, they're closely related fields, sort of cousins, uh, but yeah, it's a, yeah, uh, you have to now add in the permeability in addition to the permittivity. Yeah. Um, so thank you for another really interesting talk. In terms of how these structures are actually made, um, and if it's if it's like UV lithography, physical vapor deposition, how scalable is that when you when you discuss it with companies if you want to start making large mm -hmm. areas, you know, and and many many products? Yeah. Well, I guess uh, there the, the it's it's a question of which application you have in mind. Uh, there's a difference between making a uh, little radar chip for Samsung, which uh, uh, would uh, or, or uh, Intel or Apple, uh, which uh, would be a fraction of a square millimeter versus covering the roof of Buckingham Palace, right? Uh, and so there, for I think the, uh, uh, the, the, the question then, if we you know, go to uh, uh, many of these uh, potential application uh, domains, it, it depends on the, the, the area uh, that we're working with. Fortunately, there are relatively large area devices that are already very cheap, that have millions of electrical connections. There's not one in here, but you probably have them in your office, the big flat panel display. You have uh, a million transistors, more than a million transistors on that uh, device. That's the similar scale you need. And, and you know the Sharp and Sony, they can sell you these things for less than $1,000. Uh, it's kind of amazing that that's true, but they've managed to make it possible. To do this, this is a this is a little bit different. You have to make that very cheap. <laughs> Those who know about uh, building materials, so I, in my mind's eye, imagine a sort of more bucket chemistry way of uh, making electrochemical gate structures, where we could make, say, roofs or even windows of materials with tunable properties, not electrochromic but plasmonic. There are a number of ideas in that arena. Uh, yeah. So one very interesting thing that you mentioned today is that in a way the metal you could change the carrier concentration only a tiny little bit. In a semiconductor, of course, you can change as much as you like, right? Yeah. But for your purpose, then you lose your negative in the permittivity. Yeah. But of course, that comes from the druid thing and comes from yes. And and so there is Kramer's chronic relationship. You can't. There yeah. are somehow limitations. So you you. Uh, uh, well, we're, we're not beating the loss. Uh, there's always loss. Uh, in fact, that's one of the big problems with, 
Excuse me? Oh, the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me uh, repeat the question here, which was up in front. Um, uh, he said, uh, it, it's very hard to tune the carrier density in metal. It's very easy to tune the carrier density in a semiconductor, but you don't get the negative permittivity. And so we're walking a fine line between the two of these. Uh, and, but he brought up the Cromer's Kronig, which inherently relates the real to the imaginary part of the complex index of materials. We can't violate Cromer's Kronig. It's, you know, it's the law, it's like thermodynamics is the law. Uh, and uh, so there is loss, uh, and we accept that loss, uh, but uh, it, it, it's an acceptable price to pay. Uh, and, well, my actual yeah. question was, you, your compromise was going to these transparent conducting yeah. oxides, which are so in between. And I was wondering, is there new sort of materials that we need? Is there work to done on finding new materials where, and, well, there you start from a semiconductor and start to make it more and more metallic. But yes. can we go the other way? Can we start from metals and make them more and more transparent? You know? Okay. Are so new kind of here, here's my wish list. <laughs> I want somebody to create, there, there are two new materials that don't exist except uh, in our lexicon, cuphene and argentine. And these refer to monolayer copper, one monolayer of copper, and one monolayer of silver. So I am looking for the material scientist, even though I'm a material scientist, who can make such a thing and have it retain the carrier density because if I had that, I could actually modulate the, even at that high carrier density, I could modulate using external fields the carrier density. And that would have this property that the negative permittivity would extend into the visible. So far, nobody knows how to make a two-dimensional layer of silver or copper that has the conductivity of silver or copper uh, that's one monolayer. But if we can figure out how to do that, that would be my wish list. Yeah. I'm reminded of a conversation I had with one of the Delta directors who told me, you know, if you could only give us a little bit of ductility in your know, silicon nitride or silicon carbide ceramic, I said, I'll do that when you can make a steel that's transparent. <laughs> yeah. But that, a more serious question. Um, I've wondered a lot about the ability to manipulate uh, at an industrial scale in the way we make uh, chips and 18-inch wafers and this incredible technology with these two-dimensional materials. Has the technology advanced that? Uh, yeah, OK. So there are some hopeful signs in that regard. Um, a friend of mine in Vienna, Thomas Muller, has made an entire, using molybdenum disulfide, made an entire integrated circuit with, I think, 40 or 100 transistors or something like that. So. There's a lot of scotch tape uh, science going on uh, right now. Uh, there are some avenues for scalability. Uh, for example, I showed yesterday we can grow large 2D material structures by chemical vapor deposition. We are not, you know, there are many others who are even further out on the ed ed edge of that, advancing that art. I think that the, if the um, potential for applications and advances is there. I think the fabrication technology will will be available. I'm pretty fairly optimistic about that. But. We have one last question. Yeah. So Larry, um, I have a question. You mentioned a couple of times the Epson Yazoo materials, and you were flying on this concept, you know, heavily doping, you know, metals, and, you know, semiconductor going to metals. But you know that you know this epsilon is boiling in the you know chi three. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very interesting regime, yeah, yeah. Right, so in this highly nonlinear regime, what, what do you see in your, for example, change of the well and amplitude phase polarization, how you can use this? Okay, yeah. Um, so what I talked about, uh, what Professor Strangi asked was, um, it, Epsilon, what happened, what are the other consequences, if I may sort of paraphrase your question, uh, what are the other consequences of Epsilon near zero? Uh, I talked about linear optical properties today. There's a very interesting feature that was first identified, I think, by Bob Boyd uh, and uh, Vladimir Shalayev, that the nonlinear uh, chi-3, the nonlinear refractive index of materials, has in it, uh, it d divides by the index n. So if n goes to 0, then the index should blow up. It, it, it's limited, again, by Cromer's Groening. Um, but it's a way of enhancing the nonlinear properties. And so I think there's another bright future for tuning the nonlinear interactions of materials as well as the linear. I didn't even 
get into that at all today, but that's a really interesting area. All right, let's thank our speaker one last time.